deploying those troops with Iraqi military and police forces out among the population was so essential. It was the change of strategy more than the additional troops that really made the difference. Stephen, welcome. Uh, we are here to discuss uh, the surge, the Iraq surge of 2007-2008, in which you played a key role as the National Security Advisor. One of the reasons we're talking about it today is that uh, I and several colleagues have just edited a book, uh, The Last Card, Inside George W. Bush's Decision to Surge in Iraq, which recounts the history of that story. And it is a fascinating tale, uh, and you were at the center of it, and so we're privileged to have you here today to discuss a little bit of the history and, and what it might tell us about uh, the challenges confronting American foreign policy in, in the future. Great to be here. So there's obviously a very long Iraq story that predates the surge. It predates the decision to invade in 2003. It goes back decades. But the part of the history we're here to talk about today is uh, a finite piece that really unfolds between about late 2005 and early 2007, which is the period in which the George W. Bush administration makes the decision to put additional American troops into Iraq at one of the darkest times of the war there and to pursue a new strategy. And so I actually want to start our conversation at the end of that period. Uh, you, you wrote a chapter in this book in which you tell the story of the surge from your perspective and the first line of that chapter is quite arresting. You say that President Bush's announcement of the surge in January 2007 shocked the nation. So maybe you could start by telling us a little bit about what the surge was and what it entailed and, and why the announcement of it was so shocking when it was made. I think the public perception was that the war in Iraq was not only failing, but it had failed. Uh, the uh, Congress, even Republicans who had supported the war for a long time were privately telling the president it was time to bring the troops home. And uh, a outside panel had been uh, commissioned, co-chaired by James A. Baker, former Secretary of State, and Lee Hamilton, former member of Congress, the Baker-Hamilton Commission. They had just issued a report. And many people read that report uh, as basically saying uh, it is time for the United States to s narrow the scope of the mission and begin to bring its troops home. And that was the expectation, I think, that everybody had. And what the president did, of course, was, as we sort of say in the book, double down. Yes, more troops, but more importantly, a change in the strategy, a change in how those troops would be used in order to try to take a war which we were clearly losing and in the middle of that war, turn it around into a vehicle for success. And so if, if you back up from there a little bit, so if you go back to, say, the end of 2005, the, end of, the beginning of 2006, when this process really starts, what, what kickstarts it is a growing realization that the existing strategy in Iraq was not working. And so how would you characterize the previous strategy in Iraq? And what was it that made clear to you or other senior officials in the Bush administration that things weren't turning out as we had hoped? The prior strategy was focused heavily on a counterterrorism mission, going at those individuals that were uh, causing the violence, uh, focusing on heavily on al-Qaeda, which was uh, the accelerator of the violence. And it was really uh, born of a view that this was a Sunni-led insurgency of which al-Qaeda was the vanguard. Uh, and there was also a subtext that in fact the U.S. presence, military presence, was part of the problem. This is the and antibodies it, thesis. Exactly right. And it was feeding the Sunni reaction and the Sunni insurgency. And so the strategy was, yes, counterterrorism, go after the bad guys, go after them individually, their finances and their uh, infrastructure but do it in a way that minimized contact of our forces with the local population. And as part of a p pattern or assumption that the best thing we could do was to turn this operation over to the Iraqis themselves, get U.S. forces out of the picture so they weren't generating the antibodies, as you said, uh, and uh, turn this over to the Iraqis. That was really the strategy and mindset uh, at, uh, in this 2005, uh, early 2006 
time frame. And how did the Iraqi political process fit into the strategy? Well, it, it's a good question because uh, we had handed sovereignty back to the Iraqis in June of, 74, of 2004. Um, it provoked then a process by which the Iraqis developed a constitution. It was adopted by referendum. There was then a first election under that constitution in December of 2005. And you had the prospect for the first time of a legitimate Iraqi government elected under an Iraqi adopted constitution. The problem was that from December of 2005 until May of 2006, a long protracted process by which the Iraqis tried to put together their first fully legitimate government. During that time in February of 2006, of course, there is the bombing of the Golden Mosque of Samarra, which really inflamed the situation and marked the shift, I think, in the war from being a Sunni-led insurgency to a war of Sunni against Shia, a sectarian conflict, really, for the first time. This is what Zarqawi, the head of al-Qaeda, had been trying to do. And in the response to the bombing of the Golden Mosque of Samarra, that really becomes the dominant characteristic of the conflict. And you, you mentioned Zarqawi and his thesis of how al-Qaeda in Iraq could, could win that conflict. And it, it centered on triggering sort of a self-sustaining cycle of violence, which it increasingly appeared was taking hold by the late spring and summer of, of 2006. And so you, you write in the, the chapter that by May, June 2006, it was increasingly apparent to people within the administration that, that we had a, a strategy problem in, in Iraq, that events on the ground were not proceeding in a way that were supporting the tenets of our strategy. And yet it took another seven to eight months to actually shift to a new strategy. And so why was there such a seemingly long delay between the recognition that we had a problem and the solution that we ultimately put in place? There were a lot of elements that needed to come together and be in place before you could shift to a new strategy. And one was the political element. Until May of 2006, we did not have an Iraqi partner. And of course, it's in June that the ministers are put in place, and it takes some months for a new go government, particularly a new prime minister, uh, Nouri al-Maliki, who had never had national office, to get uh, some uh, confidence. Um, secondly, part of the things we had to do was to bring that new Iraqi government behind the new strategy. Initially, they were very resistant to the notion of additional American troops to, uh, to basically uh, buttress a shift in strategy. Um, third, the U.S. military had a lot of work that it had to do. We were training the Iraqi security forces. They were going to be integral to this, uh, this surge strategy. We had a very active program of using fusing intelligence and operations to go after al-Qaeda and the leadership. That was getting into full uh, gear. And finally, the U.S. military had to relearn how to do a counterinsurgency strategy. All of that took time. And then finally, the president needed some time to to figure out what is a new strategy. You know, changing strategy in the middle of a war you're losing um, to a strategy that will actually achieve success is not an easy thing to do. You need to figure it out. Then you need to bring your national security principles along, your military along. All of this, uh, you needed to bring the Iraqis along. All of this took some, some time. And it really was not into December and January, uh, January of 2007 that all of these pieces came together in a way that allowed us to have some confidence that we could make a shift to this new strategy and that the new strategy would succeed. So one of the things you touched on there is the actual process of the strategy review. And I think one of the things that readers will find uh, extremely striking from, from the book is that the strategy review proceeded in a way that might not be intuitive to people who haven't spent time in government before. And so it's not as though it began with a completely open, um, fu fully engaged review involving everyone in the administration. There were actual, actually separate parallel strategy reviews happening within different parts of the government. They were compartmented in a certain sense, and people who were involved in different strategy reviews didn't necessarily know 
that other reviews were going on. And then only later in, I think it was November or December 2006, November of 2006. Did, did these get merged into yeah. sort of the big set piece strategy yeah. review. And so what, why did uh, we have a process that seemed to be so segmented and compartmentalized? Was that deliberate or was that a product of uh, sort of grassroots thinking on how to redress a, a failing uh, war in Iraq? It was deliberate. And it was explained by the fact you needed to take this U.S. government and the departments and agencies that were committed to an existing strategy, you needed to convince them first that we needed a new strategy, and then you needed to have a process that would bring them together behind a presidential decision outlining that new strategy. So we started, first of all, when in the May-June time frame when the president decided we needed a new strategy. First thing we did was we got within the NSC staff a small group of people saying, well, what would a strategy review look like? And are there some really credible alternative strategy options for us to look at? So if you decide you can need a new strategy, you gotta make sure there's a strategy you can turn to. We decided that there were. And then uh, in Don Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense, Condi Rice, the Secretary of State, they also began to ask questions about, do we need a new strategy? What would that look like? And we thought it was great for them to do their separate reviews to get their own house in order. At the principal level, it was transparent. I knew what Don Rumsfeld was doing in his building. I knew what Ukandi was doing. They knew what we were doing. But we decided to keep the bureaucratic effort the, within the organization separate, to let people do their own thinking, their own uh, coming to terms with the need for change and, and get their thoughts together so they could intelligently brief their principles on what that change should be. When that process began to bring, uh, come to fruition and a consensus began to move that we, to emerge that we needed to make a shift, at that point in November of 2006, the president said, let's bring it all together. Let's sit at one table. Let's do a strategy review. And it was a strategy review then to support the president to make a decision that only the president could make. So I want to pick up on that because the, the two people in the U.S. government who presumably had the broadest view of what was happening would have obviously been the president and then yourself as national security advisor. And so could you say a little bit about the role that you played throughout the strategy process and then also a little bit about the president's role? How engaged was he in the process of reviewing the strategy and ultimately shifting it to something new? The, this whole strategy review process was designed to put the president at the center because it was his legacy we were talking about in terms of Iraq and it was he who would have to make the decision. So the whole process was, was designed to give him the information and the options and give him a way of consulting broadly within his government so that he could make the right decision. At the same time, in parallel with all of that, it was actually a process by which he brought the rest of the government along in the direction that he wanted and ultimately decided to move. Um, that was very important because, particularly with respect to the military, because if in the middle of the war you have a split between the commander-in-chief and their military or a split within the military, that is a constitutional crisis and we've seen those in our history. They don't end well. So my job was really to facilitate that process, to run a process that would inform the president, that, that would then help bring the rest of the government behind the decision that the president was increasingly moving toward. And indeed, through that process, as we would go through individual issues and make uh, uh, develop a consensus on those issues, the options began to narrow and it became increasingly clear that we were heading in the direction of the surge, which is where the president's instinct was. But he needed this process both to confirm that instinct and to bring the rest of the government behind him. So that when, in January of 2007, he announces the surge, he's got his whole national security on, team on board. Some were more enthusiastic about the surge, some were less enthusiastic. I like to say we were all in the same boat. Some people leaned right, some people leaned left. But basically, the government was behind the decision that the president made. 
So let me pick up on two things that you just said, and I would imagine, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that the, the prospect of a split between the military and civilian leadership was probably especially prominent in the president's mind because of the so-called revolt of the generals that had happened earlier in 2006 when you had a number of retired uh, general officers who had come out in criticism of, of Secretary Rumsfeld. I'm sure that left a legacy uh, in terms of its influence. But the second thing you, you said, which is interesting, is that uh, the president was always in, he was in, increasingly inclined to go in this direction. It was his instinct. One of the other things that comes out uh, from the chapter that you wrote in the book and then also from some of the interviews that are uh, related there is that uh, it may have been the president's instinct to go in a particular direction, but the decision was by no means foreordained. And there were others within the government who initially preferred very different options. Uh, and, and we're willing to argue forcefully uh, in favor of those options. And so could, could you give us a sense of what the range of choices available right. to the president looked like in late 2006 and why the other options were eventually discarded? Sure. One of the real questions is, is there an other alternative that makes sense? And so one of the w things you had to do in constructing a review like that is to do it in such a way that if you decide to stay with your current strategy, you haven't discredited that strategy by the process of your review. So the whole process was really kept uh, confidential until November when the president kicks off the formal strategy review and at that point it becomes pro public because he understands that there are alternatives that are better than the current policy and he's going to make a shift. So that, that becomes the first thing that, that he has to make. And then the question is, all right, if you're going to make a shift, what do you shift to? The military initially felt very much we ought to stay with the current strategy. Indeed, accelerate the turning over responsibility militarily to the Iraqis. Um, that was their view. And if they were going to change, turn, move off that view, they needed assurances that the Iraqis were going to be on board with a new strategy, that the civilians were going to show up to the war and use civilian resources to make the strategy succeed, and that the additional requirements on the military would not break the military. And these were all issues that the president addressed in those months between, at the end of 2006 when he was putting together the strategy. The State Department's view was a little different, was a reluctance to get involved into what was increasingly a sectarian struggle and a notion that we should preserve the democratic institutions that the Iraqis had built since 2003 and then kind of stand back a little bit and let the sectarian violence burn out. And uh, the problem with that was not too many people had confidence the sectarian violence would burn out. Uh, George Casey, who was then the commander, uh, used to say that 80% of the sectarian violence is within 100 kilometers of Baghdad. And so what Iraqis were doing is they were watching their capital melt down in sectarian violence. For us then to simply stand by and let that burn out. It was very un-American and not, I, we thought, politically sustainable. Condi ultimately came around and on the most important thing, she said to the president, all right, Mr. President, I can be on board for more troops, but not if the troops are gonna do the same thing we're doing now, because we know that's not working. And so that's why the change of strategy from counterterrorism to a counterinsurgency strategy of deploying those troops with Iraqi military and police forces out among the population to give protection to the population against Al-Qaeda and the other insurgents was so essential. It was the change of strategy more than the additional troops that really made the difference. So you've mentioned two out of the three critical elements in the change of strategy. There's their shift to a more um, aggressive population-centric counterinsurgency strategy. There's the decision in principle to insert more troops. But there was significant wrangling at the very end of the process over the number of troops, that the number of additional troops that would be deployed. And there was a, were a wide range of proposals. Uh, the administration ultimately ended up uh, uh, opting for, I believe it was five, five additional brigades, uh, as opposed to the two brigade option that had been put forward by, by others. What was the thinking behind the number of troops that were ultimately deployed to Iraq in support of the surge? Those people who were comfortable with the existing strategy were reluctant to think that we needed more and uh, we got them to the one or two brigade level. 
that's where uh, Nouri al-Maliki, the prime minister of Iraq, was initially. Um, the people who were uh, enthusiastic about the new strategy and in the review process that we had conducted, particularly initially in the NSC, uh, the judgment was that we needed more uh, and that uh, five brigades were available, five brigades needed to be used. Uh, and then the question was, well, do you commit those five brigades up front or do you say, well, five brigades are available and we'll add them as need? And at that point, uh, those people who were going to be executing this new strategy basically said a very uh, sensible thing. Look, give me the five brigades. It will send a message of seriousness that something is different and that we are going to see this through to success. If I don't need them, I'll tell you. And so the president made the decision to commit the five brigades. And it was the five brigades largely for the fight in Baghdad and then the Marine battalions to help the Anbar Awakening, which were Sunni tribal leaders in Anbar pro pro province that wanted to, to throw out Al-Qaeda but needed a little help and support. And so the battalions, the president decided, I'm going to both solve my problem in Baghdad and take advantage of the opportunity in El Anbar province to uh, administer a real blow to Al-Qaeda. And that was the right strategy. And so at, at the very end of this process, as the president is, is quite close to announcing the decision, you, you recount in the book a remarkable conversation that you had with him where he basically asks you, do you think this is going to work? And what, what was the answer that you gave him? What was your level of confidence that the surge was actually going to work when it was announced? Um, in the preparation of the surge process, um, I, this, we had a wonderful staff at the NSC, which uh, led a lot of this. J.D. Crouch, my deputy, Megan O'Sullivan, who had responsibility, deputy national security advisor for Iraq and Afghanistan, Peter Fever, Brett McGurk, others. They were convinced this was the right thing to do. My view was we only have one more chance to get this right. And so I sent them back a number of times to review the work until we were sh as sure as you could be that this was going to be work going to work. What I said to the president was, Mr. President, I think it will work, but it is the last chance we have to get Iraq right. And the president said something that was truly, I think, remarkable. He said, well, uh, Hadley, I'm glad you feel that way. If you ever change your mind, you need to come see me because I can't keep sending our men and women in uniform into harm's way if we don't have a strategy that we think is going to succeed. If I had had to come to tell him that, it would be basically telling him, Mr. President, you've lost a war in Iraq and that is going to scar your legacy forever. Not news any president would want to hear. And yet that was exactly the news he was asking me to bring him if that was my assessment of where we were. I thought it was exactly where you want a commander in chief who's entrusted with the lives of young men and women in uniform uh, in, in times of conflict. I thought it spoke very well for the president. So it was fortunate, obviously, that you ultimately did not have to end up having that, that second conversation right. with him. The story in the book is really a story of decision making, and so it, it leaves off with the January 20, 2007 speech announcing the surge. But obviously the surge was implemented over a period of about a year and a half or two years after that. There are widely varying appraisals of whether the surge worked and, and what it accomplished. Uh, how do you come down in, in that debate? Was the surge a success? Was it an operational success and a, a strategic failure? Where, where, how would you assess that question? So the initial objectives in the war in Iraq was to remove Saddam Hussein, who had pursued weapons of mass destruction, supported terrorism, invaded his neighbors and brutalized his people. And when he is toppled, that objective is achieved. But for our national security objectives to be achieved over the long term, we needed an Iraq that could defend itself, govern itself, sustain itself, and be an ally in the war on terror. That's the piece that we were having trouble to achieve in 2004, 5, 6. And that is what we achieved in the surge. Um, if I used to have a chart of the number of combat incidents. And through that period from 2003 to 2007, all it did was go up. But after the surge began to be implemented in uh, April, May, and June of 2007, it comes down dramatically. 
uh, our casualties after initial spurt come down dramatically. So by the summer of 2007 into 2008, and by the time we were finished in 2008, and uh, Maliki leads the Iraqis into southern Iraq and stabilize that situation, you had basically defeated al-Qaeda in Iraq. They were a spent force. The sectarian violence had gone down dramatically. The level of violence was at a level that the Iraqi security forces could manage. It was no longer an existential threat to the Iraqi state. And politics had resumed. It was imperfect. But people no longer were assuming they were headed for a sectarian war. And they began to start working across sectarian lines, Sunni, Shia, and Kurds. And in the elections uh, that followed in 2009 and 2010, uh, you began to have cross-sectarian uh, tickets. So I would say we took a, wa a war that we were losing, we turned it around to a war that we won, we did defeat al-Qaeda in Iraq, and we did end up with an Iraq that at that point had the potential to be able to govern, defend, and sustain itself, and work with us on residual terror. Uh, I, I, that's what we handed over to the Obama administration in January of 2009. So there are a lot of aspects of this story that are exceptional, exceptional um, but presumably the reason for studying history and studying this piece of history is that it can tell us something about how to meet the challenges of the future. So when you think back on the surge, are there lessons that it offers for American foreign policy or for presidents or national security advisors who are in charge of decision making within the American government? Um, I think there are a couple. One of them is if you're going to do something like this, a strategy shift in the, in the middle of the war, it's all about the president. And uh, it is the president who has to make that decision and therefore your process needs to be focused on getting the president what they need to do. Secondly, you know, when a war looks like it's losing and you go into the situation room and you have the vice president and the various cabinet secretaries, they're all watching the president. And if the president has conviction about the new strategy and clearly projects the will to make it happen, he can hold that community together. And people basically say, well, maybe he's right. He seems to be committed. Let's go with it because it's all going to have to be implemented by the people in the bureaucracy. On the other hand, if the president is tentative and uncertain, the whole thing begins to unravel. Thirdly, uh, you've got to do it with folks on the ground. It was a, an effort to bring the Iraqi political class and the Iraqi military through the ve vehicle of the surge to the point where they could defend, govern, and sustain that government. Um, it, it, you, you can't do it for people. You can enable them and help them do it. Um, and that has to be the cornerstone uh, of your strategy. I think that's, and, and I guess the last thing I would say is the Achilles heel, I think, of that strategy and all similar kinds of strategies, the military elements we can do. It's the civilian elements. It is helping states uh, have non-corrupt governments and building those institutions of checks and balances. Uh, it is getting the economy going, getting the infrastructure built, uh, uh, getting education system going forward again. It's those civilian activities that we under-resource. And if you talk to the military, they would say that's the problem. They never really had the civilian partner they needed so that we could have a consolidated political and military and economic and development and democracy strategy that would provide a state, help Iraqis provide for themselves a stable state going forward. That's where we fail. Well, you, you mentioned that one of the challenges of getting to the surge was that uh, the U.S. Army in particular had essentially lost its historical memory of how to do counterinsurgency in the decades after Vietnam. And so one of the reasons for studying the surge today is so that we can remember the lessons that it, it has to offer. So that's a, probably as, pretty, uh, as good a place as any to leave it. Steve, thank you for your time and insight. Thanks. Nice to be with you. Thank you.
Hi everyone, that's the end of our discussion with Stephen Hadley, the former National Security Advisor. Thanks for watching. As always, let us know what other topics you'd like AEI scholars to cover on Viewpoint. And to learn more about the Iraq surge and my new book, check the links in the description below.